Hi everybody, welcome back. So today I have a video for you that's Rhythm and Time Toolkit meets Generating Sound and Organizing Time. So Rhythm and Time Toolkit is, as you may know, a Max package that I made for working with time and for sequencing in Max. And Generating Sound and Organizing Time is a book on Gen by Gregory Taylor and Graham Wakefield. So Generating Sound and Organizing Time, which is also known as Go, includes a bunch of these chaotic functions, which I'll talk about in a little bit some more. But basically what they do is produce uh, signals that are not random, but also not particularly predictable. And you can see an example of one here on the white line. And in this video, I'm going to talk about how that signal can be used to basically humanize your patterns, humanize your rhythmic patterns by imparting some subtle uh, modulation onto time, the flow of time. So I'm just going to show you this in action and then we'll work through the patch and talk about how it's all working. Okay, so let's start with just an ordinary phaser. So right now we have a plain linear phaser as a source of time. If you're confused about what I mean by that, I have many videos on this subject. I'll put one of them above. And we're just getting a pulse. But if I move this slider to the right, you'll start to hear the intervals between those events become less regular. So what's happening here is basically we're creating a mix between an ordinary phaser, just a plain linear phaser, and this chaotic function. And then we are deriving from that mix a new phaser that's wiggly. And you can see that right here. I'm going to make it big. And it's that wiggliness that basically is modulation change over time in the speed at which time is flowing within this system. So when we subdivide this wiggly phaser, we end up with events that are not evenly distributed or not evenly spaced. So let me talk now about how that works. So up here we have this chaos function. These two patches come from Generating Sound and Organizing Time, which is a book that also comes with the Max package. And if you buy the book, then you get access to the package. If you're not an owner of that book, I could not recommend it more strongly. Even if you're not interested in programming in Gen, there are so many useful abstractions that you can just drop in like I've done here. There are also many max patches in the package that kind of show these objects in action. So it's really easy to just grab the patch and use it and not even worry about opening it and going inside, which we won't even do today. Um, the math behind these chaotic functions is weird and complicated. So I don't worry about even thinking about it. I just grab the abstraction. So what's happening here is we have this go.chaos.coule, which is one of the many chaotic function generators that exist in Go. It's generating this function, and then we're using this other um, really useful tool that comes with Go that uh, basically squishes that function to the range of 0 to 1 in this case, because these chaotic functions, they tend to sort of occupy a weird and inconsistent range. But this go.auto limit is uh, really honestly a brilliant little patch that will just say, okay, you know, there's this function that has this really indeterminate strange length, but we're just going to kind of compress it nicely into the range of zero to one without doing any weird clipping or anything. So that's beautiful. And so now we have this function between zero and one. On the other side, we have a phaser, which I'm, you could use phaser tilde to generate this. I'm using rtt.clock and that's just running along normally. We then have a mix 
which I'll go into in a second, but you can think of this for now as just being a basic linear crossfade. So we're basically just crossfading between these two. And that's all represented here. So the white is the chaos, the orange is the phaser, and the green is the mix. So you see now that I've gone all the way to the right, the green is exactly matching the white. If I go to the left, the green will actually be a triangle. And I'll explain why that's the case in a second, but you can see that its linearity shows that it, you know, bears a relationship to our phaser. And anywhere in between, it's going to be a sort of wiggly triangle. So once we have that, we pass that into this rtt.upright which is the thing that sort of phaser -ifies this signal. This signal that can go up and down, uh, it just isn't going to work very well in most cases with our TT objects, or even with many of the 8.3 objects like subdiv, and what it's, it's going to give you sort of unusual results. Sometimes you'll find patches that are comfortable with the idea of a phaser that runs backwards, but a lot of times you won't. And so in general, I try to keep with a format like this where the slope of the line is generally positive, but every so often for just one sample, it's negative, and usually it's jumping from one down to zero. So what this rtt.upright does basically is just looks at the incoming signal, takes its slope or its delta, uh, and there's a bunch of videos that I've, that I've made recently in particular where we, we, um, we do exactly this. We take the slope of a line, and then we actually kind of rebuild a new phaser, a new signal, by adding up those deltas, by accumulating them. So we take the delta, we make it positive, we take the absolute value of it, and then we accumulate. And that has the effect of giving us this signal that is uh, shaped like a phaser, and therefore compatible with many of the rhythm and timing objects. Uh, but has the characteristics of the signal that we passed into it. So you can see here, when I go for the full chaos, we get this very weird, wiggly, irregular type of phaser. And I can also have something that's, you know, subtle. And by the way, here, I'm with this function object is just allowing me to apply a little bit of an exponential curve to this mix parameter which gives us finer control towards the left end of the spectrum. Because that's the area where a lot of times you want very fine control so that you um, can add just a small amount of chaos. So let's actually hear it. Fully quantized or fully linear phaser. So even there, you can hear it kind of is deviating a little bit. And if you can imagine this being sort of the source of time that's driving a system of sequencers, right? This can be the thing that's at the top of your patch that then is flowing into all of the sequencers that you have within your patch. That this can just add a little bit of a groove that may not even be obviously uh, perceivable to the listener but does have an effect rhythmically in just creating a little bit of movement in time. So what we do here is take that signal and then just subdivide it using rtt.loop uh, and then trigger a little sample that I have in this uh, gen sampler, which is from the other videos that I've been making on sampling. In addition to this idea of being able to basically mix between something that is, uh, that is, uh, that is a, rooted in a consistent source of time or a chaotic source of time, uh, there's a, another thing that we can do on top of this, which is to take the um, the chaotic source and basically take those events that it produces and quantize those events 
after the fact, which I'll do right now. So you can hear there, the events are not regular, right? The interval between what, from one event to the next is not the same. But there's definitely more of a pulse here. There's definitely more of a grounding rhythmically. And that's because these events are basically forced to occur on 16th note, on a 16th note pulse relative to the linear phaser. And the way that we achieve this is by taking the linear phaser and subdividing it into 16th notes or whatever else we want to. And this basically represents our sort of base quantization. And events are not going to ever happen um, off of that grid, basically. We then, any events that occur from our chaotic thing in between two of these quantized events will just be delayed until the next quantized event. And the way that we do that is with this object called RTT.1 pulse, which is uh, basically a copy of the max object one bang. So this is like a really classic max object that I'll demo right now for you. If I send a bang into the left uh, inlet, there is no output until I send a bang into the right inlet. Once I've done that, I've now kind of opened a little gate inside the object. And when I send a bang into the left inlet now, it actually does pass through. Once this bang comes through, though, the gate is closed behind it. So if I send more bangs into the left inlet, nothing happens. I can open it for one bang, and then it closes again. So RTT.1 pulse is the exact same thing. It just, instead of taking bangs, it takes uh, impulses that look like this. And from its right outlet, it produces those, those impulses. And it's a really useful way to do quantization. What we do is pass the quantized pulse into the left inlet. And then the unquantized chaotic stream of pulses, which are the orange on this scope down here, um, are the ones that open up the little gate. So anytime we get one of those chaotic pulses, we'll allow through the next quantized pulse. And so that's how we get um, this sort of quantization after the fact. So quantization of events to some grid. So in this sense, the chaos is being used as a pattern generator, right? In RTT, I try to sort of distinguish it's kind of my own nomenclature, but I sometimes like to think about the idea of of time or clock modulation, you know, clock modulation or humanization or whatever as this kind of deviation from the grid. Whereas a pattern is this idea of once you have something that is quantized in some fashion, which doesn't even have to be regular quantization, but is basically broken up into discrete events, this question of well, when which events occur. And which events don't. If I have a grid of 16th note pulses, like on a step sequencer, you know, some of the events happen, some of them don't. So in this sense, we're kind of basically using the chaos as a generative pattern generator when we use it in this quantized mode. When we use it in the unquantized mode, we're producing a pulse that is... Uh, that is modulated, that it, you know, it, a pulse that's derived from a sort of modulated uh, source of time. And of course, you could combine these, right? You could have a modulated source of time that flows into this RTT dot loop and generates the sort of base quantization, and then another more crazily modulated source of time that's generating events that get quantized to that first time sources pulses. So you have tons of flexibility here to be able to basically build uh, both a groove from the use of these chaotic functions, as well as build patterns from them as well. The last thing that I'm going to talk about in this video is just a little bit of a detail that's important 
and it gets back to this um, to this triangle that I kind of glossed over earlier. So, like I said, the RTT dot upright it makes the slope positive, and then integrates and wraps around zero and one. Um, if we look at a normal phaser, right, we know that it goes negative. The slope is negative for that one sample, which this uh, this RTT dot upright will treat as a single sample where the slope is one, and that messes things up. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Um, so what we have to do to fix that problem basically is actually turn the phaser into a triangle, and that smooths things out. So let me just show you what it looks like if we don't do that. So here's my gen patch where I'm actually doing the mixing. So we have the chaos here, we have the phaser here, uh, and then I'm making a triangle like this. I'm just doubling the phaser and then I'm folding around zero and one. Another way you can do this is by using this operator called triangle. Oops, no, well, you know how to spell triangle. Um, but I'm just doing it this way. If I take these out for just a second, and I come over here and I add in a little bit of a mix. You can see there's this little like hiccup in the line some places. Like that. Oh, that was a crazy one. So this is where the, uh, the linear phaser is wrapping and the upright algorithm is trying to, you know, incorporate that. And what's actually happening is we're adding one and wrapping back around. So you see it's always you know, causing the line to jump down. And the reason it's jumping down is because it's actually going past one uh, and wrapping back around. So the solution to that problem is just make the whole thing a triangle where the slope is always either positive, whatever the phaser frequency is, or negative, whatever the phaser frequency is. Um, to be fair, it's actually doubling that phaser frequency. So this BPM isn't totally accurate. We're actually running right now at uh, 240 BPM. So you have to like a little bit of an adjustment there. And, you know, you can design your patch in such a way that, you know, makes this make more sense. Um, but yeah, that's the solution to that particular problem because you'll get weird results if you don't uh, do that. Um, all right. Let me know if you have any questions about this. I'm coming back pretty soon with some more videos about RTT and sampling and all the other things. So check those out. If you're enjoying these, subscribe, all, you know, whatever, all that stuff. Uh, and yeah, I'll see you online. Bye.